and it's a, a new form of treatment that is focused on uh, people with multi-drug resistant bacteria or mycobacteria, as you'll hear, and other types of infections. We have a new center here at UCSD, and the clinical arm of that center is here at the AVRC called IPATH, and that has to do with what the topic of our discussion uh, is this morning. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Schooley, who was the former head of the Division of Infectious Diseases and Global Public Health, and has now uh, turned that over to Dr. Smith, as you all know. Um, but continues as the uh, Executive Director for International Affairs for the University and is the Vice Chair for the Department of Medicine for Academic Affairs and other titles he holds, which I won't go into. But Dr. Schooley is going to talk to us this morning on phage therapy in the I think he crossed out deliberately anti to talk about viral research centers. So, Dr. Schooley. Thanks very much. It's great to be uh, here at the newly named Viral Research Center. Uh, it's really not fair to, uh, to be antiviral anymore because viruses can be our friend, as I hope I can convince you today uh, in this story about uh, um, a patient uh, who is a friend and colleague of all of ours and what's happened since then. The, um, this, oh, all right. So this is a story that doesn't need to be told here. Those of you who um, uh, see patients or read the newspapers realize that multi-drug bacterial resistance is becoming more and more of a problem on a global basis. Uh, this uh, are just three of the Surveys that make the point about how important this is uh, in uh, both uh, the uh, European Union, US, and also in uh, Southern Asia. Uh, it's something that is probably underestimated even in each of these, uh, each of these uh, summaries. The, um, all right. No. Do you think it's going to work now? Yes, there we go. All right. So, for the longest time, we've been uh, re uh, we've been relying on antibiotics uh, to deal with uh, treating bacterial infections. Our first antibiotics uh, were deployed about 80 years ago with the sulfonamides, and you can see that for the next uh, 40 years, there was a nice uh, steady stream of new classes of antibiotics that were discovered and deployed in the clinical settings. What you can also see is down below. Uh, shortly after each antibiotic class was deployed clinically, we began to see antibiotic resistance in patients. Uh, and the more we use the antibiotics, uh, both in patients and in agricultural applications, the more resistance that was seen. The other thing you can see is out here things get pretty sparse. Our discovery effort slowed down, both because the low-hanging fruit had already been uh, harvested and because drug companies became much more interested in things that um, were less uh, impactful, that you had to take for a longer period of time and that uh, in which the development cost could be recouped over the cost of a over the course of a patient's life, rather than a 10-day success. The story I'm going to tell briefly today, because I think you've heard it uh, many, many times, uh, is about Tom Patterson that kind of got uh, UCSD interested in uh, bacteriophage therapy. Uh, Tom Patterson, as you all know, is a professor of psychiatry here who is married to Stephanie Strathdee, uh, a uh, Dean of Global Health. They were vacationing in Egypt uh, about four, three and a half years ago over Thanksgiving when Tom developed severe abdominal pain uh, as they were floating up the Nile on a barge. He was found to have a pancreatic pseudocyst uh, when he was uh, evacuated from Luxor to um, Frankfurt, Germany. The pseudocyst was punctured by uh, a, using a gastroscope uh, to get behind the pseudocyst, in front of the pseudocyst in the stomach. A couple of stents were put through. And what grew was a multi drug resistant Acinetobacter baumani, which is a, a gram negative rod that we don't um, worry too much about, except in immunocompromised patients or patients who have devitalized tissue, uh, both of which have generally been through multiple courses of antibiotics. This was seen right off the bat uh, in his first. Uh, 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 isolation of, of bacterial pathogens. And 
led to a progressive downhill course over the next four months that started um, in Egypt, continued in um, Germany, and accelerated when he got here to UCSD. So by March, uh, he had an uncontrolled disseminated infection. He had uh, Acinetobacter growing from multiple drains in, uh, in his abdomen. He was intubated. Uh, he was developing renal failure, and the pulmonologists were talking to Stephanie about uh, whether uh, it was uh, reasonable to think, start thinking about withdrawing care. Undeterred, Stephanie um, stumbled across a paper uh, in uh, a uh, plus in plus one that uh, came from um, Georgia, their Georgia, not ours, in which uh, the um, uh, a group from the Eliava, which is an institute that has continued to study phage therapy uh, despite uh, its uh, lack of um, of uh, uh, application in the West, ever since its discovery, and they reported a cluster of, of uh, bacteriophages that were active against Acinetobacter. Stephanie uh, called me and asked if we would consider doing this, and at that point, um, wasn't clear that we had much to lose, and to make a long story short, um, the, uh, we decided that uh, we should proceed. Now, for those of you who don't know what a bacteriophage is, what a bacteriophage is is just a virus that, instead of attacking mammals attacks bacteria and they've been around for about 300 million years or more there are more bacteriophages on the on the planet than there are anything else uh, the estimates are 10 to the 31st or more bacteriophages and their basic life cycle is fairly simple they land on a uh, the surface of a bacterium uh, recognizing specific ligands they then sit down on the bacterial surface inject dna and go to work uh, replicating themselves and making lysins uh, destroying the bacterium, then going on to nearby bacteria. That's the simplest life cycle that these organisms have, the so-called lytic life cycle. We'll talk about another life cycle later. But this is what makes them attractive uh, as uh, antibacterial agents. They prey on bacteria. Now, they were discovered uh, in the sub-Saharan, I mean, the um, South Indian, uh, South Asian um, rivers uh, over 100 years ago when people who were working with bacteria in those rivers noticed that if you filtered the water over where these bacteria were growing to remove bacteria and then plated that water on lawns of agar uh, that were growing these bacteria, that holes would appear in the bacterial lawn. And so they named these factors, which were not known to be viruses at the time, bacterial eaters or bacteriophages. And there was great hope for a while that these would be used clinically to treat infections. Uh, there were two people who, who uh, um, championed this, both of whom hated each other, very much like uh, many discoverers of things at similar time frames. But this is one of them who probably should get the greatest credit because he noticed, he called it a microbe of immunity. He noticed, he called it a microbe. And he noticed that it was very specific that. Um, some river uh, water filtrates would kill some bacteria, but not others. This was not a general bacterial killing mechanism. Uh, and uh, began to talk about these bacteriophages as, as potential uh, antibacterial agents. And they, in fact, were sold uh, in the US uh, and other places for a number of years um, by Lilly and others. Uh, and they were sold based on the concept uh, that people had about how to use them, which is that you would use them to treat syndromes. And they would come up with cocktails that would be used to treat um, diarrhea, and they might call that cocktail Bactian testophage. They, they had a marketing department even back then. Uh, people who had runny noses would get bacteronophage. And the problem with that is that these cocktails of, of what may have, were probably phages, were not really well not well described, well characterized. They were kind of mixes of multiple different phages that were adjusted over time, kind of based on the whims of whichever uh, producer was making them. And they were being used, more importantly, conceptually, to treat syndromes that might be caused by any one of multiple different types of pathogens, including viruses. Um, and given the fact that these are quite specific uh, as as microbial agents for a specific bacterium, it's not surprising that if you have an undescribed cocktail thrown at a syndrome that could be due to multiple different pathogens, it was very hard to interpret uh, utility. Nonetheless, there were people who could see benefit here, 
uh, very much like uh, what happens when you go to General Nutrition Center uh, and realize that your thinking is better. So for a long time, this empiric approach to phase therapy has gone on in the East, and most of it has been uh, very much uh, used, uh, ha has been characterized by using phage preps that aren't well characterized, uh, they're not uh, purified. Um, we would not be able to, uh, to get Lucas to allow us to get near a patient with them if he saw one coming. So um, what they generally are are supernatants uh, filtrates from bacteria that have been infected with mixes of bacteriophages and given usually orally because they don't really uh, have the capability of removing endotoxin. Uh, to give them parenterally. And this kind of empiric assessment um, that has gone on has made it very hard to know what really has happened in virtually all the experiences in Poland, Georgia, and Russia, because the way patients have been characterized, 100 patients with diarrhea, we gave them bacteriophage, 60 had the diarrhea go away. Well, A, there are no controls, B, diarrhea usually does go away, uh, and C, we don't even know what the pathogens are. So. For that reason, and because antibiotics were working here, uh, and because it was hard to characterize what this was, um, we veered away from this area and uh, began to use uh, bacteria, uh, use antibiotics almost exclusively uh, for the next 60 years. Now, when uh, it became um, uh, apparent that the antibiotics weren't working with Tom, uh, we turned to a couple of different places to try to find bacteriophages for him. Uh, Stephanie turned to Texas A&M uh, with Rye Young, who uh, is a uh, uh, real force in phage biology. He's been working on bacteriophages for many, many years, but he never had uh, considered giving these to humans because he was concerned about side effects. He's a PhD that was worried about what the side effects might be. And Stephanie, being as persuasive as she is, talked to him on a Friday night for about an hour and a half and told him about Tom and told him about her husband, he was dying, and before long, Rye was crying as well and said, well, what the hell, I've got two postdocs who aren't doing anything this weekend, just send him a your organism, I'll see what I can come up with if you'll just get off the phone. Oh, she didn't tell me that, but anyway, uh, she persuaded him to, uh, to allow, to uh, turn two postdocs loose, finding some phages, and they found four, uh, basically, that were active against Tom's organism over the next couple of days. I got in touch with the FDA, uh, and the FDA, uh, rather than being um, uh, obstructionist, as I expected, uh, were very excited about this and said, uh, you know, we've been looking for a case like this. Um, we have people who've been thinking bacteriophages should be used clinically, but we haven't had a patient who's sick enough to, for us to say he's got nothing to lose, um, who would have access to bacteriophages that have been well characterized, and would have a, a group of people stupid enough to ask us to use it. And so they said, we'd love to, to see this pursu uh, pursued, and why don't you call the people at Walter Reed and at the U.S. Navy Biomedical Defense Command and see if they have some, because they're also working on acinetobacter phages. And they went to work, and they came up with a four-phage cocktail. And within about 10 to 14 days, uh, we had two cocktails that were active against Tom's organism. Uh, without going through all the intermediaries of cleaning out the endotoxin, which was done with quite a bit of, of, uh, of uh, leadership at San Diego State. Uh, phages were soon at Tom's bedside. This is Andrew Picel, the interventional radiologist, given the uh, first dose of phage into uh, one of three of Tom's drains at the time. Uh, not much happened over the next three days. He remained stable uh, and didn't have any apparent side effects from this. But by Thursday, uh, given the state he was in when the Navy phages arrived and realizing that we were growing acinetobacter not just from the abscess cavities, but from his peritoneal cavity, from uh, his blood periodically, from his sputum. Basically, it was overrun with acinetobacter. It made sense to try to deliver the acinetobacter phages uh, perennially. And we knew that the Navy phages were quite uh, uh, clean in terms of endotoxin. And so we found a fellow who was willing to do this. Um, uh, this is Melanie McCauley, for those of you who uh, don't recognize her. Melanie is going to be going to Walter Reed Army Institute of Research next year as a new hire there in a newly um, uh, formed um, research unit uh, on emerging infections. But to make a long story short, over the next couple of days, uh, Tom got better uh, and uh, opened his eyes about 48 hours later, recognized his daughter, still had a, a very tortuous um, course, ultimately got out of the hospital. He's back uh, now. Uh, on the faculty um, collecting retirement credits. 
Now, if you want to read more about it, uh, Stephanie has written a book that is now out about uh, two months ago. Uh, she'll be glad to have you purchase a copy and we'll sign as many as you like. She's also got a movie deal um, and uh, is uh, asking to have um, Julia Roberts play her, but they're not sure about that. So what else did we learn from this case? I mean, this uh, kind of anecdote would have been what would have happened in most of the experiences in, uh, in Eastern Europe. We would have said we had a patient who was really sick, we gave him bacteriophage, he got better and went home. What we tried to do while Tom was in the hospital was learn a few other things about the biology of what was going on to try to guide our therapy and think about the next patient. The first thing was um, it became clear that uh, we were worried about, when Stephanie first called me, I thought we'll never find a phage or even uh, a cocktail of phages active against Tom's organism in time. In fact, it has not been hard, with a few exceptions, to find bacteriophages for almost any patient that we've um, been asked to look to uh, consider. And the reason for that is they are everywhere. Um, they uh, are go where the money is. Uh, they live around bacteria in almost any place that you find bacteria. Uh, you can find phage that uh, are able to kill them. Uh, the way they were assessed in vitro uh, is using a biolog device, which basically looks at respiration of the bacteria. You can see here with uh, Acinetobacter alone, uh, the um, uh, measured in respiration units, bacteria grow quite well with any one of the individual phages of the cocktail suppression over about a 20 hour period. Now the um, we also found in this case that you can purify phages in multiple ways, and that's important. I won't go through the details because over the last couple of months, um, quite a few academic labs have come out now and are able to provide phages for clinical use so that we were not, we're not as limited as we were in having to go to the two biotech companies that were the only two that had the capability of doing this for a while. The other thing we learned is that uh, resistant bacteria emerge quickly. Uh, this is the figure I just showed you up here showing the Navy phages uh, after going after Tom's pre-treatment isolate. These are the Texas A&M phages and you can see that compared to the Navy phages they're, they're leaky and they're beginning to lose activity before you get to 12 hours. You can see also that they lose activity. This is another isolate from Tom taken at day six. By day six they're not active at all. The Navy phages are beginning to sequentially lose activity and uh, by another several days, all of the phages were um, no longer active um, against his organism. Now, some would say this is horrible, but in fact, it's actually an indication that the phages are doing something to his acinetobacter. As Doug Richmond has said many, for many years, the way to define an antiviral agent is to look for something that causes resistance. And that's, in fact, uh, what these phages were doing to his acinetobacter. Now, we thought that by the way they were selected, uh, these were quite different phages. And the way they were selected at the Navy was to take 100 um, different phages from a library they had and to uh, look at, um, at that time, 40 or 50 different acinetobacter. And if you had a phage that was active against acinetobacter A, C, and D, uh, and another phage was active against uh, acinetobacter C, G, and F, the, they thought this would be a different phage. And so they built a library based on that concept and had about 98 phages they thought were uh, different from each other based on their, on their host targeting. And when they tested Tom's organism, the dark blue ice, uh, bar, uh, boxes are individual phages in their library that could suppress uh, his, the growth of his organism for 20 hours in the biolog device. And they chose four of these uh, as the ones to go into the first cocktail based on their activity, thinking they were different. In fact, when they were sequenced much later, they were very similar to each other. This shows you kind of the, you know, the, the uh, 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 myophage library um, uh, of uh, universe of phages, showing you that the four phages that they thought were different based on host range are really quite similar. Now, when resistance developed uh, to Tom's phage, the resistant isolates, I mean, to Tom's acinetobacter, the resistant acinetobacter was sent back to the Navy, and they came up with a, uh, another phage uh, that when uh, uh, against, this is TP3, the resistant isolate, uh, that had activity, when added to one of the previous phages, was actually quite good at suppressing uh, the replication of his, uh, his 
uh, evolved isonidobacter that was no longer responsible for the first cocktail. Uh, this uh, shows you the myophages that were used in the first cocktail, again, uh, looking very similar. Now we know they're very similar genetically. And this is the new phage. It's a potophage, totally different. And when it was put onto the dendrogram, you can see its way out here. So what has evolved, um, in part on the basis of this case, uh, is a much more nuanced version of what's different in terms of trying to create a, a phage cocktail that has orthogonal combinations in terms of emergence of resistance. Now, to get back to the resistance issue, um, this is just a phase contrast uh, uh, micrograph showing you a big juicy capsule on Tom's isolate before he was treated. You can see by TP3, it's much harder to see this. And what was going on here is as the phage were pushing the acinetobacter uh, toward resistance to the phage, it was having to uh, mutate uh, it was selecting for mutations uh, in genes encoding uh, several of the capsular um, uh, structures. Uh, and these differences genetically were associated uh, with the loss of uh, the capsule. By the loss of the capsule, uh, the um, bacterium was much less invasive in a, in a silkworm model, which is used to look at invasiveness of bacteria. So the short um, message here is that by selecting for phage-resistant acinetobacter, it was selecting for, for acinetobacter that were less fit and less able to cause mischief uh, in uh, invasive models. The Navy uh, is still trying to do the back mutations necessary to nail down the specific sequences, but the, um, the areas of, of, uh, of evolution that were most uh, obvious were ones that involved the capsule of the organism. So we missed a lot of uh, uh, opportunities in this uh, scramble. Uh, we didn't do a very good job of figuring out uh, dosing intervals and things. We did get some pharmacokinetics uh, that confirmed what we knew before, that phage, when given intravenously, are cleared within about 30 to 60 minutes. Um, we didn't uh, look at the time at the concentrations of phage uh, in places where he was infected. Uh, we uh, didn't really do a very good job of the microbiological assessment. We were able to semi-quantitatively notice that there was the gram stain showed fewer gram, ne gram negative rods and the cultures were less frequently called heavy uh, growth, but that's really uh, extremely um, qualitative. Uh, we tried to get Rob Knight's group involved to look at the microbiomics, but uh, couldn't get through his email wall at the time. Uh, and uh, and uh, didn't look really at, uh, at um, cellular and uh, humoral immune responses to the bacteriophages. We did see some antibodies that bound the bacteriophages and caused some loss of activity in a neutralizing ac uh, assay, but we didn't have pretreatment serum to look at. And uh, we uh, didn't really look at the evolution of the phage themselves as they were chasing the bacteria that were becoming resistant. So a lot of things that really biologically would be quite interesting were missed in this opportunity. At the end of the day, it was uh, made a great book. It will make a great movie, I guess. Um, and uh, but it's just an anecdote. Uh, we had a patient who was quite sick. Uh, some interesting biological observations were made. He got better, and he's now home. Uh, but this is not the kind of uh, evidence one can use to make a um, claim that the reason he got better was the phage administration. It was certainly temporally related, uh, and. Um, the, uh, those of us who were close to his case saw this downward trajectory that changed suddenly when the phage were added. But that's not how you decide, how, that's not how you learn how to use things uh, to systematically give them to patients in other settings. Now, we've had since that time quite a bit more experience here at UCSD with phage therapy, led mainly by Saima Aslam. Uh, Darcy Wooten has also been involved. We treated now another half dozen patients. Um, and we learned a little bit from each of these uh, that uh, has helped shape thinking about where to go with uh, the next uh, uh, range of clinical trials. The second patient treated here was a patient who had had a lung transplant for pulmonary fibrosis. And he had a um, surgical problem at one of his anastomotic sites and got into a series of recurrent bouts of pseudomonas pneumonia that became progressively resistant to um, uh, antibiotics. And uh, he was ventilator dependent uh, and could not be cleared of his pseudomonas. Sima uh, used a, um, a uh, series of 
phase interventions, and to make a long story short, he too eventually cleared his pseudomonas, was able to get off the respirator, uh, and, uh, and, um, and recovered from his pseudomonas pneumonia. He's still alive, but he's having trouble with some graft versus host disease and some other issues, um, and some, some, um, some chronic rejection. Um, but the infectious issue was, was taken care of. Now, one thing that was learned here is that uh, we had an argument with the uh, company that was providing the phage for him. They wanted us to, to deliver the phage uh, by an aerosolized route. Based on the experience with Tom, we wanted to give it intravenously because we thought it was easily, uh, more easily quantified and more easy to control that way. And we comprom compromised and said, okay, uh, if you give us the phage, we'll give it orally, uh, we'll give it uh, an aerosolized route to make you happy as long as you let us give it intravenously to make us happy. Uh, it took a long time for them to figure out how to um, dose this in a nebulizer. They were working in a hood up on Stein 4, trying to measure phage as it was spewing out in various ends of the hood for a couple of weeks. In the meantime, we started giving the phage intravenously. And... About 72 hours after the dosing began, the patient needed to be bronchoscoped uh, for clinical indications, and his bronchial washings were loaded with phage. So the message really here is that if you give the phage, they find their food. And uh, there really is no reason to uh, try to inject phages into joints and put them on people's noses and things. Uh, it really, the bloodstream does very well getting things around. And if it doesn't, um, you've got a problem that's bigger than the organisms growing on the surface. Uh, so, the next patient was one that Darcy treated. Uh, he was a man who had had uh, extensive open head um, trauma, had a uh, multi-drug resistant acinetobacter infection of the prosthetic, um, of the plastic prosthesis. He was treated for about a week, uh, had no uh, untoward effects, but the pe uh, family withdrew care because of his underlying um, uh, brain damage. We didn't really get a full trial of, of this. The next patient was a patient who was on the transplant list but was taken off because she had a recalcitrant pseudomonas infection uh, in the context of CF. Um, Sima got her hands on a, another phage cocktail, treated her uh, over the course of several weeks. Um, the pseudomonas infection was cleared up to the point she went back on the transplant list, was transplanted successfully, is now living quite happily uh, in LA. Uh, the, uh, this patient, these two patients, were patients that had left ventricular assist devices that had gotten infected with Pseudomonas or with Staph aureus. They'd been treated for between, uh, three, uh, between two and three and a half years with intravenous antibiotics without clearance uh, and had this soupy discharge coming out through the, uh, through the access lines and, and one was actually um, open to the air. The surgeons were not willing to do a heart transplant in that setting. Uh, they both received phage cocktails, uh, and over the course of a couple of weeks, the infections dramatically improved clinically, got to the point they were put back on the transplant list. Both were transplanted, and both are home now doing well. Um, this patient's only positive culture was on the part of the, when, at surgery, was on the part of the uh, left ventricular cyst device that was open to the air. Uh, the rest of his intraabdominal cavity was, was sterile. The reason these are interesting is, in addition to the antiviral, antibacterial activity, I, I see I still forget what I came here to talk about today. In addition to the antibacterial activity, phages will attack biofilms, and so it makes them very attractive to think about using to treat prosthetic joints and other implanted prosthetic devices that are often hard to clear with antibiotics because of biofilms. And then finally, this is a patient treated a couple of weeks ago that had had a, a long-standing complicated um, uh, prosthetic joint infection of her knee. Uh, and uh, uh, the um, Sima had asked for six weeks of, of uh, therapy uh, for this patient. The company said, oh, no, no, we've been successful in treating patients for two weeks, and that you can only have two weeks of phage for this patient. Uh, she got treated for two weeks of an injection of phage into the joint, two weeks of intravenous phage along with uh, antibiotics, followed by a two-week antibiotic tail. Uh, during that period of time, the uh, drainage uh, from this chronic uh, sinus cavity stopped draining. Uh, the inflammation got better, the patient had less uh, pain, but not surprisingly, the um, infection relapsed several weeks after antibiotics were stopped. She's uh, gone back and negotiated now a six-week course and the, the company now has disclosed the previous case was an acute bout of infection, not somebody who had a prosthesis that had been infected for months with fibrotic tissue and so forth. 
So where are we now? Uh, we're at a place now in which we have got a number of kind of empiric and uh, anecdotal observations. We have a, an immense amount of knowledge about phage from the, uh, from the standpoint of, of uh, molecular biology and interactions with bacteria. They've been one of the major tools we've used to study bacteria. But what we don't really have is um, uh, an understanding about how to use them in clinical settings. And what we need are rigorous clinical trials uh, to the same kinds you would uh, design if you just take phage out of your brain and think about it as an antibiotic. And that's not what's been, been done in the past. Uh, Melanie, you missed your, your slide, I'm sorry. All right, and we, you missed the announcement about your job at Rare, so you can go home now. No, anyway, welcome, no, stay please. Okay, uh, so where do we go from here? We obviously need to do clinical trials, and, and that's um, uh, the direction that we're trying to go uh, here at IPATH. Uh, at the same time that we're trying to continue to treat people uh, and, and facilitate treatment of people, who need treatment for emergent reasons. There have been a couple of clinical trials already that have been published, one of which uh, is a great negative control uh, that was published in The Lancet uh, about six months ago, uh, done by a group um, uh, called, uh, a company called Phericides, and they had the idea that they would treat uh, patients with large burns uh, uh, that were growing pseudomonas uh, with a phage cocktail that would be placed on the gauze uh, over these open wounds. And they compared that uh, in this open label controlled trial to silver sulfadiazine, which is kind of the standard of care for topical burn treatment. Now, what they learned from this is that it actually matters how you design your trial. Um, they didn't think about confounders and the randomization strategy. It turned out the group that were randomized to the phage uh, cocktail were substantially older than the ones who uh, were uh, in, uh, randomized to the uh, silver sulfadiazine of uh, age manners in burns. They wanted to give 10 to the ninth plaque forming units of phage uh, per milliliter in each of their gauze applications, but they had so much endotoxin in their cocktail, they had to dilute the phage a thousand fold before they uh, were able to use it. And they hadn't understood that the phages that they used in this, thir in this uh, dozen phage cocktail interfered with each other. And by the time they got to the bedside, they were only given between 10 and 100 plaque forming units of phage per milliliter. So they basically were giving close to placebo and had not done the uh, stability testing and the incompatibility testing to understand that they weren't really treating these patients with phage. Um, the, um, the other thing they weren't doing is they weren't taking the pseudomonas from the individual patients who were being treated and testing to see if they were susceptible to the phage cocktail they were using. It'd be like doing an antibiotic study uh, and not taking the time to see whether or not the organism you're treating is susceptible to the antibiotic you want to test. Uh, and then finally, uh, they designed the study uh, with the help of burn surgeons, uh, and they asked the burn surgeons if they had pseudomonas, uh, uh, patients with pseudomonas infections of their burns, they said, yeah, we sure do, look at these bacteriology reports. And what they didn't understand is that many of them are polymicrobial, in fact, most of them are, uh, and um, the micro lab, uh, the micro report is not a way to sort out in a burn uh, what's really driving the infection. And they tried to end up with clinical endpoints. It's not surprising this one failed, but at least they did enough work to understand why it failed. Now, what studies are being planned here? The first study that uh, had been about to go uh, is one that Sima uh, de designed based on the um, experience left ventricular assist devices. The plan was to recruit uh, 10 or 12 patients with uh, left ventricular cyst devices that had been chronically infected with Staph aureus, not candidates for surgery, and essentially replicate the experience uh, with the uh, first couple of patients if possible. Uh, the company was supposed to provide the phage, uh, unfortunately got merged very much like Crimea was merged into Russia by a company called C3J. They're now called Armada, uh, and they are now rethinking about what they want to do with their uh, clinical development. Now, in a conference call with them yesterday, uh, things actually may be turning out a bit better than even with what we had thought. Uh, they got some money from the Department of Defense to do a placebo control trial of uh, standard of care antibiotics versus standard of care antibiotics plus phage for staph sepsis. We told them that was a bad idea because looking for daylight between the standard of care arm uh, and um, uh, benefit with phage is going to be very hard in patients who are treated with standard of care antibiotics 
a couple of days after they come into the hospital by the time you get the protocol all organized. If you look at all of the studies with uh, uh, vancomycin plus uh, genomycin or vancomycin plus rifampin, it takes more statisticians than patients to see anything. So what we talked to them about was instead looking at, um, at, um, at infected pacemakers, which, in which the standard of care is to remove the pacemaker uh, because sterilization uh, is not possible with antibiotics alone. So Simon's idea was to uh, take patients who uh, were candidates for surgery because of their infection and treat them with uh, the antibiotic we would normally use, depending on what's MSSA or MRSA and adophage, and look to see uh, in, in 15 patient cohorts whether or not uh, patients were being able to avoid surgery. If you start having failures, uh, you would then go up to the next uh, dose, range, dose level. So this is both a dose ranging study and a pilot study for clinical efficacy. And uh, currently this is uh, being discussed uh, within the company and with our collaborators at Walter Reed who were involved in some of the laboratory aspects of this. Another study that uh, is um, going to be done here at the AVRC is one that we hope will get a much better idea about what's really going on under the hood when you give, a fa when you give phages to patients. One of the challenges in, ass in assessing any of the microbiological impacts of phage therapeutics in the past is they're always given with antibiotics because you need to uh, give standard of care um, in patients who need to be treated. What we wanted to do was find a population of patients who at the time didn't have to be treated clinically for their infection, but who had bacteria that could be quantified uh, if you gave phage alone. And so talking with Doug Conrad of our uh, CF clinic, uh, uh, he said, we've got a lot of patients who have cystic fibrosis. They're um, doing well clinically, periodically have bouts that require us to put them in the hospital and uh, give them antibiotics and uh, physical therapy. But Many times they're just home doing well, and if you culture their sputum, they always have pseudomonas. Uh, so what we decided to do is recruit some of those uh, and to give them uh, phage alone and be able to look at the microbial response without having the antibiotics in the background. And in this context, um, the NIID has been quite happy about it. Uh, Connie sent in a supplement to the ACTG grant yesterday, actually, and this morning by email they uh, we're quite happy with the supplement and said they would be happy to fund it. That's the easiest uh, money that's ever come down here. Um, and um, the plan, our phage source is no longer going to be C3J, or it's no longer going to be amplified, that is, was part of this, this hospital merger I discussed. Uh, Nelson Michael is taking over the bacterial pathogenesis and emerging disease branch at Walter Reed, and Nelson is going to now provide the phage for us for this study. In this study, we're gonna measure uh, much more quantitatively the antimicrobial effects. We're gonna be working with, uh, we're gonna look at resistance dynamics, uh, PKPD relationships. Alan Perlson, who is here this week, uh, is gonna be doing the mathematical modeling to be able to uh, use some of the same tools that were used to assess what went on uh, with HIV and HCV and thinking about interactions with pathogens. Um, we're gonna be able to look at some of these issues related to phage valency uh, how rapidly resistance develops depending on how many active phages there are in the cocktail uh, in this uh, uh, study. And then uh, Rob Knight is going to do uh, microbiomic studies that will look at what replaces the uh, pseudomonas when you clear them with, hopefully, with the, with the uh, phage that you're using. The plan we have is to do cohorts starting with the dosing that we've been using, about 10 to the ninth plaque forming units, comparing intravenous phage to inhaled phage, and then looking at microbiological endpoints going up by a log uh, in the next two cohorts, and then taking those data and seeing which route seems to be the best approach and then doing another dose at 10 to the 11th and trying to see if there's a quantitative relationship to uh, the antimicrobial effect uh, based on how much phage uh, is given, to again, to get a better idea about dosing, uh, dose regimens and so forth. This will be followed up uh, with a multi-dose study, and if the model works, we would use the same approach to study M. abscessus, Burkholderia, and other pathogens that patients with uh, cystic fibrosis chronically have, and to study other phage preparations as we move into synthetic phages uh, that would be directed towards some of these pathogens. Now, finally, uh, let's move on to when you get past the clinical trials, uh, can you actually develop these uh, clinically? 
The problem we have is that most of the pharmaceutical companies are standing here and the biotech companies are there going after the, uh, after the uh, success and they don't have a lot of experience in drug development. The pharmaceutical companies um, have seen that there's been 100 years of drug development and that's longer than most of the horizons of many of their mid-level executives who aren't really necessary, aren't really interested in staking their future on something that uh, hasn't yet worked. So uh, there are a couple of exceptions that are beginning to interact with these biotech companies, but a lot of this is being done in biotech companies. The two biotech companies that had been working on this were Amplify, the company that is now merged. Uh, the new company, uh, Armada, uh, which is uh, a, the name they gave themselves when they merged yesterday. It used to be C3J. They've merged the two. It's called Armada. For those of you who don't speak Russian, that's a Russian word for tank. Um, Armada is going to think about a, an approach in which you have a fixed phase cocktail uh, that would go after a given bacterial pathogen as a whole. So if you had a library of staph organisms, you'd assemble a library that, uh, in which you would have four or five phages that collectively would be able to take on maybe 80% of the staph you might see uh, coming in clinically. If you do that, you can then have this fixed cocktail, which is basically a product, that would be available, and when a patient comes in, you would uh, see if, if their staff happens to be susceptible to the phage cocktail. The good news is it's already in the pharmacy uh, and well characterized enough for Lucas to let you give it. Uh, the bad news uh, is that in any given cocktail for a patient since it's fixed, um, it will not be uh, active against, uh, all, the, all the components of the cocktail won't be active against the, the uh, staff you're trying to treat. Now you can do this with organisms like Staph and Pseudomonas in which any given phage has a fairly broad host range. You can come up with a finite library that will be able to kill most of those organisms. There are some organisms though like Acinetobacter in which to develop a library like this you'd have to have two or three hundred phage and you can't develop a cocktail like that because of interference and in the, in the logistics of it. So for those, uh, an approach that has been uh, proposed is, an, is a uh, custom page cocktail. Here what you would do would be uh, collect a library of Acinetobacter um, and then start collecting Acinetobacter phages and building a library that ultimately is big enough that you think that whenever a new one comes along clinically you can go to your library and find a combination that will be able to suppress that that particular organism. You would then bottle those and put them in a fixed cocktail for that patient. The good news here is that this cocktail will be active against all of the um, all of the, uh, all of the cocktail will be active against the Acinetobacter. The bad news is it's complicated to do, but it's logistically feasible with technology that's available these days. It's a, it's a expensive proposition because you don't just collect these isolates and throw them on the shelf. You then have to characterize them uh, in a way that satisfies the FDA uh, and satisfies us as physicians, uh, and most importantly, uh, Lucas as a pharmacist. Uh, so I hate to be picking on you, Lucas, but it's, it's all right. Um, and by that, we want to make sure the phages are safe to give. What are the concerns? Well, uh, phages have been used for years uh, by bacteriologists to move genes around. And you would not want to use phages that have the capability of integrating into the DNA of the bacterium. Uh, and as they jump out, taking genes with them. And this gets into this issue of lifestyle, uh, which I'll show you a diagram about in a minute. Uh, Lifestyle phages that, phages that have a lifestyle of integration are called lysogenic phages, and they are the workhorse of bacteriologists who've used them as tools to move genes around. You don't want to use them clinically because in addition to being able to come in and out of the pathogen you're treating and moving uh, resistance genes and potentially pathogenesis genes around, once they integrate into the DNA of the bacterium that they attack, those bacteria generally create substances that resist infection by new phages. So you essentially immunize that bacterium from attack by new phages. So you would not want to use a phage that has uh, the genes open reading frames that predict the ability to integrate. You would not want to have any genes that uh, predict toxins because there are uh, bacteriophages that carry toxins around with them, virulence factors uh, or antibiotic resistance genes. You obviously want to make sure that the phages are clean enough to use. And by the time you do that for two or 300 phages to make a, li a, a library for Acinetobacter, you spend a lot of money. So that's a complicated approach. Now the third uh, commercial approach uh, is to uh, 
think about uh, synthetic or semi-synthetic phages, and there are uh, a handful of companies doing that. Uh, Sniper Biome uh, is a company that calls itself a CRISPR company. Uh, it's owned by Eric Prince. No, it really isn't. Um, it's a company based in uh, Scandinavia that has spun off of Harvard and MIT. The approach here is to use a, um, a uh, uh, carrier phage, essentially, to take in Cas CRISPR that has been uh, targeting, that targets a specific sequence in the bacterium you want to kill. So these are really very customized phages, but you could customize them in a way that they would have a receptor range that would be broad, but a very specific targeting gene that would let you kill just what you wanted to kill, but will be broad enough to uh, get around some of the host range issues, because there are common sequences, for example, in Acinetobacter you might go after. Uh, another company, Locus of uh, Bioscientists, is doing the same thing. They're not located in North Carolina. They have an alliance uh, with Johnson & Johnson uh, and are getting to be better and better uh, 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 prepared for clinical trials. This is Armada, the uh, former C3J that I mentioned. Uh, they were down here last week uh, and uh, seem to be much more, uh, I think, on the ball now in terms of thinking about clinical trials as well. They have a pseudomonas um, cocktail that they're working on uh, with synthetic phages. Now, what would you want to do if you wanted to fix a phage up? Well, I've already mentioned uh, altering the lifestyle. And by that, I mean, this is the uh, lytic cycle on the outside, the kind of what we've been thinking about conceptually the last four hours, it seems. Um, and that, in the lytic life cycle, phage go in, they uh, inject their DNA, they make lysins, they replicate, they blow up the bacterium, they go around and do it again. In the lysogenic lifestyle, they go in uh, and they integrate into the DNA, they enter a, a lysogenic cycle, and they repress new uh, phage from coming in. And then periodically, uh, the phages are induced and they then begin to come out and they go back into other bacteria, taking bits and pieces of DNA if they want to. And as I mentioned, you don't want to, you, you don't want to do that. And to get around that, uh, you can find the two genes uh, that are most responsible for this, uh, this integration, uh, the integrase gene and the repressor gene, and cut one or both of them out and make uh, phages that would no longer uh, be useful, they're, they're formerly not useful clinically, and use them for um, as lytic phages. The other thing you might want to do is to develop a broader host range. Could you take an acinetobacter phage, fix up its, um, its um, binding ligands in a way that you could attack a, a larger fraction of them and come up with a fixed phage cocktail? And finally, there are some bacteria like the gonococcus in which there are phages out there that infect them, but they don't kill them very well. Could you create a better warhead with better license that would allow you to use uh, environmental phages that would be able to uh, go after multidrug resistant gone, uh, gonococcus? Now, have we gotten to the point we can do this? Well, we have. Uh, published uh, day before yesterday is this paper from uh, the UK uh, in which Graham Hatful uh, uh, was involved, I'll show you him in just a minute, uh, in taking care of a patient uh, in the UK uh, who had cystic fibrosis uh, and um, uh, got infected with Mycobacterium abscessus. Uh, she had a relatively severe form of cystic fibrosis uh, with this double uh, Delta 5, F508 allele uh, and presented in infancy. Uh, and by the time she was seven or eight, uh, was growing M abscessus, was treated for uh, the next eight years with a a cocktail of NTM drugs, uh, but unfortunately her pulmonary function declined to the point that uh, even with uh, cystic fibrosis crectors, uh, she had an FEV1 of about 29% or predicted about, about a year ago. It was listed for transplant. She was transplanted and did well initially, uh, uh, and then two and a half months after the transplant site, she developed some erythema at the surgical incision site, began to get uh, consolidation on her chest x-ray, uh, and Mycobacterium abscessus reappeared in her sputum. Uh, they, her transplant, uh, our pediatric ID uh, physician, Helen Spencer, uh, added uh, NTM drugs, uh, tried to modulate her immunosuppression. Uh, she developed a big mass in her porta hepatis they thought was uh, lymphoma because she had uh, 10 to the 11th copies of EBV in her DNA in her uh, bloodstream. She got a little rituximab. Uh, Soon, uh, she then developed, uh, the, her sternum began to break down, then she got a bunch of skin lesions that showed uh, granulomatous uh, inflammation, and she was in home on hospice um, 
uh, because they, it was clear that her uh, mycobacterium abscessus uh, was progressing despite maximal medical therapy. Uh, this shows you her skin lesions. Uh, you can see this is her sternum, kind of these things beginning to heap up. These are skin lesions on her arm. These, this is her uh, PET scan showing you uh, this portohepatis lesion and scattered uh, uh, activity elsewhere in her nodes. The phage hunt was led by uh, Graham Hatville, who is a professor uh, of, 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 uh, in the biology department at Pitt. Uh, Graham uh, runs a program called Seafages, which is a program that uh, has accumulated 15,000 mycobacterial phage over the course of the last 12 years. Uh, Seafages is a Howard Hughes supported program that uh, teaches undergraduates uh, quantitative biology. And the way they do that is to um, turn undergraduate students in a two semester course loose on trying to isolate phages for M. schmegmatis from the environment. And so in this course, they go out and they um, pull up pieces of grass and they scratch each other's ears and they, they come in and they uh, discover phages with M. schmegmatis. That was chosen because it's easy to work with, it's safe, you can do it on a bench top. It's hard to get in trouble with that as a freshman at Kansas State. Uh, and uh, they then learn how to sequence them, they annotate them, and they send them into Graham, and he puts them in a freezer. And uh, so for a long time, he was doing this as kind of a, um, as a um, academic uh, uh, teaching exercise. And uh, at the same time, he was doing some really elegant molecular biology with phages. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, began to think about whether they might be active against things other than M. schmegmatis. And he froze, took a few of them out of the freezer, and most of them were not. Um, about a year ago, a uh, year and a half ago now, two years ago now, began to uh, get called about patients with M. abscessus infections and uh, uh, suggested that, and talked to Graham about it, and he said, well, maybe we should look at M. abscessus, and he began to look at some of these patients. The first two patients he looked at, he couldn't come up with a phage that was active, but the third patient was this patient we talked about today, and he found a phage in his library called Muddy um, that was uh, this is a serial dilution of his phages showing you these telltale holes in the agar that we've talked about uh, against M. schmegmatis and against GDO1, which is the isolate uh, from this patient in the UK. And you can see that Muddy uh, gives you nice clear plaques. It turns out to be a phage that is naturally lytic. It has lost its repressor gene uh, or has a deletion mutation in it, and it is not a problem in terms of, of um, of, of being uh, temperate. Now, what I should have said is one of the problems with mycobacterial phages is all, almost all of them are temperate. And so that has been one of the things in, in nature, that's been one of the things that's held up the use of them clinically. Um, so Muddy was one of the ones that uh, would be an anchor phage in this library. Uh, there was another phage called Zoe that, was, uh, that grew quite well on the M. schmegmatis lawn grew a little bit on the M. abscessus lawn, but had these kind of cloudy plaques. The cloudy plaques suggest partial lysis or a lysogenic uh, lifestyle. And what Graham then did was use this approach that he calls bread technology, uh, in which uh, that he developed uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, and the long-winded um, story I won't give today, but essentially you take uh, a uh, mycobacterial um, strain, uh, M. schmegmatis, that is infected with a phage that creates a protein that promotes recombination. You then co-electroporate the DNA of the phage you want to fix along with a shorter region of DNA that you want to substitute into that uh, M. Uh, schmegmatis that is primed to look for um, the uh, uh, recombination. And by PCR, you end up with the first plaquing getting mixed uh, phage populations, you then take them out further, the second time around, you have a pure one with the mutant one uh, with the deletion you want or one that has a substituted base. And what he did here was he took Zoe uh, and he took out 45 bases in the repressor gene and now he has one that gives you clear plaques on M. abscessus GDO1. The third phage that he uh, had in his, in his back pocket was one called BPS, which had 33 uh, uh, amino, uh, uh, 33 uh, base pairs pulled out of its repressor gene, but it didn't grow very well on uh, GDO1, so he serially passaged it on GDO1 and changed its host range, and now has one uh, that uh, he calls host range mutant 10, uh, 
that has a point mutation that allows it to grow better on GDO1. So with these three phage, uh, the, uh, their mug shots are shown here, uh, the uh, patient was treated. Now, just to make one quick last point, uh, these are the phages I've been talking about. This is the, these are the, uh, I, this is the lawn of bacteria from uh, our patient in the UK. Uh, this shows you another laboratory strain of M. abscessus. No activity there at all with these phages. This is the first patient that we sent him from, um, from uh, Washington, the second patient from LA, showing you that these are still very narrow host range, and we don't have a broad enough library to treat a lot of patient, uh, every patient yet. Now, this is what happened when she was treated. You can see over the course of the next several months, these skin lesions I showed you earlier uh, began to flatten uh, and uh, improved. You, you can see here her pre and post treatment PET scans, things beginning to cool off. Uh, you can see her FEV1 post transplant. Uh, she kind of plateaued and then got the phase therapy and now has continued to improve in terms of her FEV1. She's now back at home uh, and in school. And this is just a spec scan showing the port hepatitis lesion getting better on therapy. She had so many uh, phage, uh, or so many uh, uh, M-abscessus uh, in various parts of her disseminated infection that unlike Tom, who cleared his phage every time we gave him a dose, she basically had continuous phagemia uh, during the first, round, the first um, a week of her phage therapy because the phage were being infused, replicating in, the, uh, in her M. M schmegmatis and then being sp spilled back into the bloodstream. So where are we now, 100 years later? Um, well, just an hour later. Um, we have much better understanding of the biology. Uh, there have been a lot of improvements in understanding how to characterize the phage. We're learning how to begin to manipulate them genetically, uh, how to make them. Uh, and we really, I think, have a, a, a lot better chance of moving ahead in uh, using engineered phage uh, in the future. Uh, we're hopefully going to be in a phase that uh, lets us do very rigorous clinical and translational research in the middle of the whole process that helps us develop some products as we go, find out what's wrong with the phases we have in specific infections, fix them up if we can, and then go back through this loop. And if we've done that, uh, then they become products too. If they haven't, we go back to the drawing board. In other words, a bench to bedside approach that we hope will be carried out here at the AVRC. Uh, to tell you uh, the last uh, point, what is IPATH doing these days in terms of patients that you see? Uh, Lizzie um, Lampley, who you know well from uh, her career here, is now the coordinator of IPATH. She uh, looks, uh, she receives uh, all of the uh, requests that we get for phage consideration. Uh, we then look at them and triage them in, uh, as to whether or not they seem reasonable. If they do, uh, Lizzie then goes and gets records. Uh, the bacterial cases, Simon and I look at, the mycobacterial cases Connie looks at. Uh, if they seem reasonable, we get in touch with the physician, uh, and then we look into seeing if we can get them uh, therapy under E, I, and D. So if you have patients, we'd be glad to talk to you about whether or not uh, we can find phage for them. So that's IPATH, and one more book for you is this one. Uh, this is a book that was written by a lovely young woman who. Um, uh, named Mallory Smith from uh, Los Angeles, who graduated from Stanford. Uh, she had cystic fibrosis and had a Burkholderia cepatia infection uh, that um, two years ago we tried to find phage for. And to make a long story short, the, um, they didn't call us until she was basically on a respirator and septic. And by the time we found a phage for her, um, she had succumbed to her infection. But she wrote a very lovely book about living with a chronic illness that uh, her mother published posthumously that uh, I'd recommend to uh, you if you want to hear more about uh, the hope that a lot of people have with chronic illness for uh, interventions like this. So I'll stop there and be glad to entertain any question anybody has. Thanks very much. Chuck. has been at least partially managed by combining more than one particular product and uh, look like potentially for phages that may also be true is that avenue being explored yeah all of the all the ones we have used have been in combinations and what we're trying to do is to understand better what criteria we should use to call it a real combination some of the phages that have looked different are similar when you look at their resistance profiles kind of like the favorins and uh, 
and um, nevirapine. So we're trying to uh, go from efavirenz and nevirapine to efavirenz and uh, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, valutegravir. So, uh, and that, oh, there we go. So a lot of it is, is trying to understand better how to characterize multivalency. That's a great question. Susan. Um, thank you. Uh, how often, in, particularly in these longer course therapies, how often is therapy going to need, do you think, a mid-course correction for resistance? We're learning a lot about that, and, and I think the extreme case was acinetobacter because the phases are so narrow in their post range that resistance is easy for the organism to develop. There has been a little bit of resistance in a couple of patients Sima has treated over the course of a month or so with pseudomonas phages, uh, but for the most part, uh, not. Uh, we've been treating this patient with MF sepsis infection for nine months, and her organism is still sensitive. So I think it's going to depend on things like replication kinetics, population size, uh, the um, uh, receptor the phage uses, uh, host defense, uh, have to be worked out in clinical trials. How often do we check for resistance? Uh, you know, in a, uh, we've been looking, uh, I think in clinical trials, we've got it set up to look about every two weeks. Um, it, again, it's going to depend on the organism treated. Uh, thank you. Great talk. How often have you been administering them? What's the frequency of dosing and how did you decide? Well, the frequency of dosing generally has been uh, Q12. Uh, some have been getting phage more often. It was based mainly on empiricism. Uh, and based totally on the uh, experience with Tom. Uh, we did treat him more frequently early on, uh, and uh, we know um, about uh, clearance kinetics. And I think it's going to also, as we do these clinical trials, one of the things we're going to look at is exactly that. It may turn out that a generic answer is not going to be um, the way to go. Um, in patients like Tom and the patients like this um, young woman from the UK, as I showed you, you give the phage and it takes off and replicates. And so you may not need to give it very often in people with, with uh, large uh, organism loads, which is kind of counterintuitive based on our previous brainwashing by pharmacologists. On the other hand, uh, in this pacemaker infection study that I showed you briefly, we talked about it yesterday, and one of the things people uh, on the call were talking about is maybe you should give these phages much more often, like every four to six hours, because here you have a dispersed population uh, uh, that are not contiguous, and you're going to need to deliver them repetitively through the bloodstream to keep uh, pressure on the phages, as opposed to having a, a population that will self um, will self uh, sustain. So I, I think again, in clinical trials, we'll have to work some of that out. It may depend on the infection. Sarah, there's I, I don't there's a lot of questions, Chip. So the first one is um, your readout for activity is based microbiologically, but the ultimate goal would be a synthetic production of shelf phages. So what's the deal with, a, a, are they producing these libraries that they can start getting synthetic phages against and looking at banks of organisms? Well, they're collecting banks of organisms. It's not been done as systematically as one would like. Uh, and the phages that have been bottled so far have been mainly environmental phages. Uh, they can be quantified uh, by qPCR or by um, uh, or by uh, platform unit assays, uh, and it can also be quantified by uh, just measuring protein. You know, in the preps, uh, that the what the FDA will want to use in the uh, clinical trials has not yet been worked out. And the study that Sima had put through the FDA as a phase two was going to be platforming units. And I mean, isn't there also a role for you just getting some resistant organism, bad resistant organisms from the hospital and start, you know, instead of waiting for the emergency patient to start getting this library going of? Well, I didn't get into this because of time, but we're doing that now uh, in this Tijuana outbreak of, of multidrug resistant pseudomonas infection. Those of you who um, have been following the um, CAHAN um, uh, notifications have heard about a case of several cases now over 100 cases of multidrug resistant pseudomonas infection in Tijuana that were associated with uh, surgery at three or four hospitals, mainly for bariatric indications. Um, some of the patients, many of them, in fact, were medical tourists and were bringing the organism back to the U.S. Um, the CDC uh, put out a notice not to go to Mexico for surgery because of this, and um, uh, in 
January when one of the patients came back to San Diego and tried to get hands on it to see if we could come up with a phage because the mortality rates were about 30%. And um, couldn't engage, uh, the patient was getting taken care of, it. scripts are sharp and I couldn't through the health department get them to engage us with the people to get us the organism. So um, about a month ago, we got called by a patient from British Columbia who had gone down there and had come back after his Rue and Y broke down and had a belly full of, uh, of multi-drug resistant um, Pseudomonas and he was willing to send his organism. So we sent it to uh, uh, Nelson Michael at Rare uh, and, uh, and Stu Tyner uh, and they put it through their whole genome sequencing um, uh, loop and it turned out that what had been billed down there as a single outbreak it was not a single outbreak. This organism didn't carry any, any carbapenemase at all and they had been defining the outbreak is a VIM produ VIM producing, uh, VIM carbapenemase producing uh, outbreak uh, that was associated with a surgery in these hospitals. Um, so when I found out that that organism was different, I got back to Eric McDonald and said, you know, you have organisms in the public health library that would be nice to look at and there's nothing else to do with them. Would you send them? And after kind of a few iterations around that, they were willing to send them to Walter Reed three isolates. And when they sent those three isolates, it turned out those three were VIM carbapenemase producing. Uh, Walter Reed uh, and uh, we, with Stephanie going down and getting river water from our side of the border, from Tijuana, came up with phages that are active against uh, those, um, those strains. And when Walter Reed sequenced those, it turned out these isolates were not point isolates. They were similar, but not similar enough to the isolates that would be in a single hospital. They were coming in from the environment. When they looked at it compared to the dinder, to the collection of, of multi-drug resistant pseudomonas strains they had in their library, they have a big uh, collection process that, do, that continuously um, uh, samples the world. It turned out this organism had been present in the U.S. for at least half a decade all over the place. And the reason they were calling it a Tijuana strain is they were looking at Tijuana hospitals and defining the outbreak that way. Great question. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.